A uh, very good morning to everyone watching this webinar today on the topic diabetic patient and the surgeon. I'm Dr. Jasmine and the session has been moderated by Dr. Krishna sir. Now as surgeons it is very important to know about how to manage a diabetic patient because very often we encounter patients with diabetes and we look up to endocrinologists to come to a ward and manage our patients. Whether uh, while it's good that we seek an endocrinologist opinion while managing a patient with diabetes it is also uh, favorable that we know as surgeons how to manage a patient of diabetes in our wards. Now brushing up just the diagnostic criteria that was given by the American Diabetes Association 2020, the latest guidelines on how to diagnose type 2 diabetes mellitus. A fasting plasma glucose level of more than or equal to 126 milligrams per deciliter or a 2 hour postprandial glucose of uh, two, 200 milligrams per deciliter or more during an oral glucose tolerance test which is uh, giving 75 grams of anhydrous glucose and measuring the glucose level two hours post the glucose load. The HbA1c level of more than or equal to 6.5 percent or any patient with a random plasma glucose level of greater than or equal to 200 milligrams per deciliter with classical features of hyperglycemia which are polyuria, polyphagia and polytipsia or presenting in a hyperglycemic crisis. A brief introduction to diabetes in surgery. Now we know diabetes is a burgeoning problem in worldwide with more than 200 to 400 million people affected and it has been found there is a higher incidence of surgeries happening in diabetics as compared to non-diabetics and which is why we should be more acquainted to managing diabetes in surgical wards. The lifetime risk of an emergency surgery in a diabetic has been found to be 5%. Now in diabetics as compared to non-diabetics there is a 50% higher risk of uh, perioperative mortality. Now this can be attributed to several causes majorly being the microvascular and macrovascular complications of diabetes. As we know, the microvascular complications can be diabetic, neuropathy, nephropathy and retinopathy and the macrovascular complications being the cardiovascular uh, disease due to diabetes and peripheral vascular disease. Another problem is the risks of hypo and hyperglycemia. Uh, now, hyperglycemia certainly uh, it causes uh, osmotic diuresis and fluid and electrolyte imbalance, which already we see in a patient post surgery or in the perioperative period. And adding to it is the risk of hypoglycemia, which is certainly way more dangerous than hyperglycemia. Now, the risk of perioperative infections. Now, due to lowered immunity, diabetics are prone to perioperative infections. Inappropriate insulin infusion. This is mostly iatrogenic when uh, doctors in surgical wards do not know how to manage a patient with diabetes then an inappropriate insulin therapy can predispose the patient to risks of hypo and hyperglycemia and also a failure to identify high risk patients now it has been found in studies that almost 65 percent of patients who undergo surgery they do not have a pre-op hba1c level and yet we take the patient to surgery now we, uh, this is not to say that HbA1c is somehow correlated to the perioperative morbidity and mortality, but that we fail to identify high risk patients in this process in a case of undiagnosed diabetes. And hence, we cannot, in, uh, we cannot give the patient the appropriate therapy that he needs in the perioperative period if we fail to identify that he is a diabetic. And it has been found that the complications in diabetes are more pronounced in a case of type 1 diabetes mellitus as compared to type 2 diabetes mellitus. Now, while uh, considering the perioperative management, some important points to be taken into account are 1. The pre-op HbA1c level, the glyco uh, glycated hemoglobin level. Uh, which we will discuss that more than 8% is considered as a factor leading to the postponing of surgery. Yes, we should postpone surgery if the HbA1c is uncontrolled and more than 8% as studies have recorded. Second thing is when we are posting a diabetic patient for surgery, we should keep in mind the patient is to be posted in the earlier half of the day rather than in the later half of the day because as such diabetes with all its metabolic derangements, it uh, induces a great deal of stress 
on the patient who is already at stress because of the surgery, anesthesia. And if we are scheduling the surgery late, we are adding fasting to the st as a stress factor. Now, blood glucose monitoring. Blood glucose monitoring and insulin therapy are other important considerations which normally we do not have to bother in a non-diabetic. But this is an additional thing that we have to keep in mind while considering a surgical patient with diabetes. Hypoglycemia, again an important risk factor for perioperative morbidity and mortality. As I said, the stress of fasting and surgery can predispose a patient, a diabetic patient to a hyperglycemic crisis like diabetic ketoacidosis and hyperketotic hyposmolar syndrome or HHS. Now, enteral and parental nutrition. We often encounter diabetics in need of enteral and parental nutrition, which we shall discuss later. Now, what are the perioperative risks with diabetes mellitus? Now, this has been uh, very well enumerated by the Gogo et al. in the ADA guidelines in 2002. Uh, in their study, they found that the risks with diabetes mellitus comprise of post-operative surgical site infections and post-operative sepsis because of the lowered immunity in case of a diabetic. And it's been found that with high uh, blood glucose levels affect a neutrophil uh, chemotaxis and uh, there is a delayed inflammatory response uh, to any site of injury, be it the surgical or otherwise. And this leads to an increased incidence of uh, infections which cannot be countered well by the body's immune mechanisms. And this, if aggravates, can lead to post-op sepsis. Also, it has been found to be associated with endothelial dysfunction. And uh, cerebral ischemia is something which uh, they have enumerated in, uh, which they have found in rat models. It has not been uh, very uh, well described in human study subjects. And impaired wound healing is another important factor uh, affecting a surgical patient with diabetes. And precipitation of diabetic ketoacidosis and HHS uh, because of the stress of fasting, surgery, anesthesia and impaired glucose control. Risk of acute kidney injury. Now, as we have discussed that uh, in diabetes, like there is a risk of hyperglycemia if there is inappropriate insulin uh, management, if there is inappropriate glycemic control. And that can lead to osmotic diuresis. That leads to the fluid electrolyte imbalance. Compounding with the fluid electrolyte imbalance that has occurred due to the surgery per se, and this leads to uh, this leads to a pre-renal type of acute kidney injury, and also the hyperglycemia itself can cause a renal type of acute kidney injury, and this electrolytemia, especially uh, that of sodium, um, potassium, and magnesium, are something that we have to be wary of. Like uh, hypokalemia is one thing that we see with insulin infusion as it causes the cellular uptake of potassium ions. And this, uh, this electrolytemia of potassium and magnesium are arrhythmogenic. It predisposes a patient to arrhythmias. And also uh, often neglected uh, factor that we see with in diabetics is the occurrence of pressure sores. Like pressure sores are seen in any immobilized patient, especially post-surgery, a non-ambulatory patient. And in a diabetic, as we have seen, there is impaired wound healing. There is a risk of post-operative surgical site infection and the patient is immobile. So obviously, there is a chance of occurrence, increased predisposition to pressure sores, which also do not heal well and fast. And all of these factors, they contribute to increased morbidity and mortality in a patient with diabetes, thereby prolonging the hospital stay and adding to the hospital burden of costs. Coming to the pathophysiology of diabetes in a surgical patient. Now, in a surgical patient with diabetes, as I have been saying, there is a stress response that is induced by fasting, the surgery, the anesthesia, and the impaired glycemic control. Now, this stress response, as we know, induces catecholamine release. <clears throat> These catecholamines have a tendency to inhibit insulin and stimulate glucagon at times of stress. Now, as we know, insulin is an anabolic and anti-catabolic hormone. Now, when this insulin is inhibited by these catecholamines, we get pronounced catabolic effects and anti-anabolic effects or a reversal and attenuation of the anabolic effects. 
so what we see is like there is increased in uh, there is increased glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis which are the uh, which are the catabolic processes like increased glycogenolysis will further cause an increase in the plasma glucose levels and how is there a anti anabolic effect this is by inhibition of the glycogen phosphorylase enzyme which is responsible for glycogenesis <clears throat> so glycogenesis is not going to happen because that enzyme has been inhibited by phosphorylation also there is activation of the cyclic amp mediated protein uh, protein dependent kinases and that all will lead to increase in the catabolic effects of proteolysis lipolysis and glycogenolysis all contributing to an increase in the serum glucose or plasma glucose levels and a increase in protein and fat breakdown all of these will contribute to the stress hyperglycemia that we see with surgery now coming to the concept of stress hyperglycemia stress hyperglycemia is a transient hyperglycemia which you may see in a patient of diabetes or a non diabetic so in this definition it has included only non diabetics so any transient hyperglycemia either in a case of diabetes or not in a non diabetic during an acute illness or an invasive procedure with plasma glucose levels of more than 180 more than or equal to 180 mg per deciliter with the levels returning to normal after removal of the stressor and withdrawal of glucose lowering treatment in patients previously with a hba1c of less than 6.5% all of these satisfy the definition of stress hyperglycemia seen in, with respect to surgery the severity of this stress hyperglycemia depends on the type of surgery the invasiveness of surgery and the duration of surgery more invasive the surgery more prolonged the surgery obviously the stress factor increases and the stress hyperglycemia increases maximum risk of stress hyperglycemia has been found with respect to cardiac surgeries now this stress hyperglycemia pre can a uh, predispose to a uh, metabolic decompensation leading to diabetic ketoacidosis or um, hhs and it has been associated this hhs has been found to be associated with a 42% mortality in the perioperative period of especially patients of cardiac bypass the mechanism of stress hyperglycemia as we just elucidated a uh, increase insulin resistance with increase in the endogenous glucose levels now the role of hba1c now this study was done by underwood et al uh, in 2014 Uh, comparing the preoperative hba1c levels with the clinical outcomes in patients with diabetes they had included about 1700 patients 620 of whom had a hba1c value within the last 3 months this glycated hemoglobin is an indicator of glycemic control within the past 3 months because the lifespan of a rbc is 120 days or about 3 months so we as i had previously said that only 35% of patients being posted for surgery have a pre op hba1c level now the length of hospital stay is same as that of non diabetics if hba1c level lies between 6.5 to 8% while it becomes significantly longer once the hba1c levels are more than 8% so this is why the recommendation that if we find a patient with hba1c of more than 8% and we are planning a elective surgery it is prudent to postpone that surgery until normalization of that hba1c level with a good glycemic control and there is as of now no standard for an optimal hba1c level but we take 6.5% as the cutoff level now it is important to note that a hba1c of less than 6.5 as well as more than 8 are both associated with an increase in perioperative morbidity and mortality and not just more than 8% and obviously there is no role of this hba1c in emergency life saving surgery where the focus should be on perioperative glucose control rather than seeking a hba1c value but it is better that we take a sample for this hba1c so that in any patient with undiagnosed diabetes we become more cautious in the perioperative management of such a patient now the target glucose range has been a 
much debated as to how, what should be the targeted glucose range in a patient, uh, in a surgical patient of diabetes. And perioperatively, uh, it has been found that 80 to 180 milligram per deciliter is what uh, we should aim at, uh, with majority of patients lying within 140 to 180 milligram per deciliter. Now, this was uh, clearly dictated by the NICE sugar study in 2009, where they it was an RCT where uh, they took two groups, one with uh, conventional glucose control and another with intensive glucose control. The conventional glucose control where the levels were maintained at less than 180 milligram per deciliter, anything less than 180. And in the intensive glucose control group, it was between 81 to 108. And it was found that there is a higher incidence of severe hypoglycemia with increased perioperative mot mot mortality in case of the intensive glucose control group. This was also shown by Wiener et al. in 2008 when uh, they did a study on the benefits and risks of diet glucose control in critically ill adults. Now they found that there is no significant benefit that we see as such with a tight glucose control. Rather, it causes more hypoglycemia and more risk of mortality in a perioperative patient. So, the target glucose range is 140 to 180 milligrams per deciliter. Now, approach to management. Uh, this is based, initially I will discuss about uh, the approach to management given by the American Diabetes Association guidelines on uh, the management of a surgical patient with diabetes in 2002. Uh, well, this is way old, but uh, of late, uh, there has been no elaborate guidelines as this uh, by the ADA in this regard. Uh, but the newer evidences and uh, newer studies uh, which dictate newer guidelines for management, managing a patient with diabetes will obviously be added to this later. So, uh, while deciding the management of a patient with diabetes, we decide who are the candidates for intensive perioperative diabetes management. They are uh, type 1 diabetics undergoing both minor and major surgery and type 2 diabetics undergoing major surgery. Now here we define major surgery as a surgery under general anesthesia or any surgery with a duration of more than one hour. And here, the prime focus of management is on insulin therapy with dextrose and potassium infusion. Now, we are coming to the perioperative management of patients according to the ADA 2002. Uh, first, the first group in consideration is patients being managed with diet alone. The patients who were being managed with only uh, diet and changes in uh, lifestyle, lifestyle modification. One, there is no special pre-op intervention that is required in these patients, uh, but we should ensure a fasting blood glucose level on the morning of surgery. Now, there has been uh, no recommendation about uh, getting a serum electrolytes and urine ketones to be done in patients uh, with diabetes in these guidelines, but it is prudent and as is being practiced in our wards, these can be added to the test profile. And intraop hourly blood glucose monitoring with insulin infusion is given in case of a major surgery or if the blood glucose levels rise more than 200 milligrams per deciliter. Coming to the patients who were initially on oral hypoglycemic agents, sulfonylureas, which uh, include uh, commonly used drugs like libenclamide and glipizide or glimipride, these are the common sulfonylureas that we encounter uh, in our wards uh, being given to diabetic patients and these are uh, recommended to be discontinued one day prior exception of chlorpropamide which is discontinued two to three days prior because of increased risk of uh, renal dysfunction and lactic acidosis in patients on chlorpropamide. Now other oral hypoglycemic agents can be continued until surgery that is you skip the morning dose but you continue it until the evening before surgery. Metformin is given is uh, withheld one to two days before surgery till 72 hours post-op. This is because this was according to the ADA 2002 recommendation. I'll come to the later recommendations later. Now this metformin, uh, this is associated. Uh, this is specially practiced if uh, we have a patient with a risk of renal hyperperfusion, lactate accumulation, 
and wh- why is because renal hypoperfusion generally is seen in patients with uh, with a fluid imbalance with hypovolemia and lactate accumulation is similarly seen in patients with hypovolemia in patients with sepsis being taken up for surgeries in such ca- patients you withhold metformin one to two days prior and also in case of uh, IV contrast administration. Now, surgical patients often need radiological interventions, uh, radiological investigations with administration of an intravenous contrast. Now, there is an added risk of lactic acidosis with the same, and hence this metformin is withheld one to two days prior to planning an IV contrast study in a surgical patient with diabetes. For minor surgeries, uh, we start the patient on a sliding scale insulin for any blood glucose more than 200 milligrams per deciliter. Now remember minor surgeries was lasting less than one hour. So in such patients, uh, we, we start the patients with OHAs as soon as they are started on oral diet. So it's not like we are giving the patients on prolonged sliding scale insulin because once a pi- patient of a minor surgery started orally, you can resume the oral uh, hypoglycemic agents. Now for major surgery, you need to get a hourly capillary blood glucose monitoring <clears throat> and accordingly the insulin infusion along with glucose and potassium is given to the patient. Uh, extreme values of uh, hyperglycemia or hypoglycemia mandate a repeat test. Now when we get a too low or too high va- value we should do a repeat and we should send a sample immediately of uh, immediately for venous glucose with lab confirmation. Now patients on insulin therapy, if they are being posted for any minor surgery lasting less than one hour, you, because a patient on insulin, you need to be more uh, cautious. And even in case of minor surgeries lasting less than one hour, you have to uh, switch uh, over to intermediate acting insulin from long acting insulin one, two days prior. And you have to ensure a perioperative blood glucose monitoring because such patients are at high risk of hypo and hyperglycemia. And we have to give a continuous intravenous insulin infusion that is started before surgery, even if the surgery is of a minimal duration. And accordingly, we add glucose and potassium. And early blood glucose monitoring is done intraoperatively as well as in the immediate post-op period. Once a patient is orally started, we can stop the infusion and go back to the uh, insulin therapy the patient was initially on prior to surgery. And while doing so, we should ensure a one hour overlap between the IV infusion and the usual insulin regimen because uh, the insulin that we use in IV infusion is a short acting insulin and once being given intravenously its half life is very less about some less than 15 minutes 10 to 15 minutes and if we take time in starting the usual subcutaneous insulin regimen which is going to take some time to act so that intervening period where you don't have either the IV insulin or the subcutaneous insulin is may prove to be harmful and hence As a method of caution, we ensure a one hour overlap between the IV infusion and restarting the usual regimen. Now, in major surgeries, uh, preferably a patient of diabetes should be admitted two to three days prior in the hospital. Or because of whatever reason, if the patient cannot be admitted, we should ensure a self-monitoring of blood glucose being done at their homes at least before each meal and at bedtime that is four times a day at least before each major meal breakfast lunch and dinner and at bedtime and there the target blood glucose uh, value is preprandial that is at each meal before each meal to be between 80 to 120 and at bedtime between 100 to 140 now, while admitting a patient of uh, diabetes for major surgery, uh, we should do a thorough physical examination, especially to rule out any autonomic neuropathy, uh, to uh, look at the cardiac status of the patient, because all these are additional things. We do not just address, uh, we do not manage a disease, right? We manage a patient as a whole. And we should look at all the parameters that may be affected by the disease the patient is suffering from. So. We should do a thorough physical examination of the patient. We should look at the cardiac status, the renal function and the electrolytes of the patient, the urine ketones. We should ensure the patient is having a normal glycemia. 
and we should plan accordingly the insulin glucose potassium infusion with hourly capil uh, capillary blood glucose monitoring and adequate fluid and electrolyte management because fluid and electrolytes are of paramount concern in a patient with diabetes because diabetes predisposes to dyselectrolytemia which is a major cause of morbidity. Now the fluids that are preferred are dextrose as we have to combine it with a continuous intravenous in insulin infusion and which could be alternated with normal saline. Now, according to the ADA 2002, uh, this Ringer lactate and Hartman solution with high lactate concentrations was not advised because they thought it would uh, further uh, add to hyperglycemia. Now, we shall have a look at the studies uh, later uh, disproving this theory. Now, let us have a look at the how to plan an insulin dextrose potassium infusion for a patient with diabetes. The methods of delivery are two. One, you give a separate insulin infusion with other uh, with IV administration of glucose with potassium added in it. Second is the GIK regimen or glucose insulin potassium regimen where you combine all the three in the single intravenous set. Uh, then uh, here the target high glycemia level is 140 to 180 as I have discussed earlier according to the NICE sugar study of 2009. And this infusion is to be continued until oral intake is established. This should be started preoperatively and should be continued postoperatively until the patient has resumed his normal oral diet. Now, the first subcutaneous insulin is given 30 to 60 minutes prior to removing the IV access. Before you plan to discontinue the IV infusion, you give the subcutaneous insulin at least one hour prior. That is what I have said before that there is a one hour overlap between the two and you tailor the therapy based on the blood glucose and potassium is added due to risk of hypokalemia. Now in 500 ml dextrose as was mentioned in this guidelines uh, 10 milliculins of potassium can be added but generally surgical patients are as such at risk of hypokalemia so you can add up to 20 milliculins of potassium in each uh, 500 ml dextrose because more than that would uh, actually uh, be very painful for the patient with the high risk of uh, thrombophlebitis and second is that it will lead to it can lead to hyperkalemia so the conditions where you should be cautious uh, while adding potassium are hyperkalemia and in renal insufficiency now why we are also adding glucose that is the minimum calorie requirement to prevent catabolism and surgery is a catabolic state so we add calories at the rate of 5 to 10 grams per hour which has been found to be the value needed to prevent catabolism now how do you plan an intravenous insulin infusion now a patient who was on insulin they are the ones who we are giving IV insulin infusion right so we know the total daily insulin dose of the patients who were earlier on insulin therapy now when you start an IV infusion of insulin you give uh, we you started at half to three-fourth of the total daily insulin dose uh, now what I have I mentioned here is the initial in infusion rate at unit per hour it's actually half of uh, half to three-fourth the daily insulin dose in units per hour suppose the patient was initially on uh, say 12 units of insulin the total daily dose of insulin that the patient was on was 12 units and when you are starting an insulin infusion you should give half the dose that is 0.6 okay uh, that is like uh, half is six units right so this 12 units uh, which the patient was uh, i'm sorry actually the 12 units the patient was on is over 24 hours so in unit per hour it becomes 12 by 24 or 0.5 units per hour so that should be the initial infusion rate that is 0.5 units per hour now in case of type 1 diabetics you start at 0.5 to 1 unit per hour while in type 2 you start at 1 to 2 units per hour and accordingly you titrate later you titrate according to the blood glucose levels now, how do you prepare this insulin infusion? This insulin infusion is prepared with a short-acting insulin or regular insulin. You take 25 units of insulin and you add it in 250 ml NS. That gives you 0.1 unit per ml, right? And this is infused at 10 ml per hour. That will give, give you around 1 unit per hour. Now, another important uh, 
consideration here is there is a risk of this insulin getting adsorbed uh, adsorbed to the IV tubing and uh, earlier it was a common practice to add albumin to this intravenous insulin infusion to prevent the non-specific adsorption of insulin to the intravenous set but uh, nowadays it has been changed to flushing the IV set tubing with 50 ml insulin solution so as to saturate it and then there is no risk of any non-specific adsorption of insulin. Now, uh, giving dextrose, again, as I discussed, 5 to 10 grams per hour in order to prevent catabolism and to each 500 ml dextrose, you add 10 to 20 milliculins of potassium. Now, the regimen for a uh, separate intravenous insulin infusion, as I discussed just now, and uh, this is the exact level, it's like how do you start an infusion? Initial infusion rate is decided by the pre-op total insulin dose and you give half to three-fourth of it and then you keep checking hourly capillary blood glucose. If it is less than 80, you check the uh, glucose after 15 minutes and you withhold the infusion for that time. Between 80 to 140, you decrease the infusion by 4 ml per hour or 0.4 units per hour. Okay. And between 141 to 180, which is the target glucose range, you do not change, make any changes to the insulin infusion. Between 181 to 220, you increase it by 0.4 unit per hour. Between 221 to 250, increase by 0.6. Again, between 251 to 300 by 0.8. And more than 300, you increase the infusion by 1 unit per hour. All this is based on titration. You keep checking the blood glucose and keep titrating the IV insulin infusion. Now coming to the uh, glucose insulin potassium regimen here you add all the three components together in the single IV set so here uh, how do you calculate the insulin uh, requirement you give 0.3 units of insulin per gram of glucose right and so you add uh, here 15 units of insulin in 500 ml of 10% dextrose because if we consider uh, if we consider one a bottle of dextrose, uh, like 500 ml dextrose, it will have around 25 grams, right? And uh, so, because one liter of uh, 5D will have around 50 grams, so 500 ml will have 25 grams. And in 25 grams, you it comes to around 8 units of insulin, 7.5 to 8 in units. But according to these guidelines, it is like 15 units of insulin in 500 ml of 10% dextrose. And you add... 20 milliculins potassium to 500 ml dextrose uh, whether it is 5% dextrose or 10% dextrose and you infuse this solution this GIK solution at the rate of 100 ml per hour which gives you 10 gram glucose per hour which we have read earlier is the minimum value to prevent catabolism and gives you insulin 3 units per hour. <coughs> Now this is the regimen for uh, the GIK combined infusion. Here if you have a value of uh, less than 80, you, you decrease uh, f by 5 units in case of 5% dextrose and decrease insulin by 10 units if you have if you are giving 10% dextrose. Similarly less than 120, you decrease by 3 units or 5 units in case of 10% dextrose. When you have the target glycemia that is 120 to 180, no changes are made. Now again, uh, you increase it by the same rate if it is hyperglycemia. Coming to emergency surgery in diabetes, as we have discussed, 5% lifetime risk of uh, emergency surgery in diabetics. Now the various factors that can lead to emergency surgery in diabetics and why we have this 5% risk is one, this diabetic patients uh, they have multiple macrovascular and microvascular complications, cardiovascular diseases which mandate emergency surgery and also uh, they can they are predisposed to several other infections which can lead to surgical complications and diabetics have peripheral vascular disease leading to diabetic gangrene etc which can predispose a patient for emergency surgery. Now one thing to be kept in mind is we have to be aware of factors or conditions which can mimic a surgical acute abdomen. They are diabetic ketoacidosis, 
diabetic autonomic neuropathy and diabetic serotable syndrome now what is a uh, diabetic in diabetic autonomic neuropathy uh, you will find gastroparesis so there will be uh, because of autonomic neuropathy there is gastroparesis and the patient will uh, present as if the patient is in obstruction and you will find acute abdomen in the patient and you may think it of think of it as a uh, a surgical cause of acute abdomen but it, it it is actually a diabetic autonomic neuropathy and uh, in diabetic serotable syndrome what happens is there is a uh, there is pain in the thoracolumbar uh, dermatomes Uh, due to neuro, uh, diabetic neuralgia and you will think that this is arising from uh, from any visceral organs okay the pain in the thoracolumbar derm dermatomes uh, means uh, you will think of the pain arising from any of the visceral organs and you can treat it as a surgical acute abdomen but uh, the clues to identifying a diabetic serotable syndrome is that uh, you you will find that there are pupillary and gait abnormalities uh, that are seen in patients with diabetic serotable syndrome so the take home message here is that a thorough history and physical examination is absolutely essential in a patient with diabetes to rule out all these mimickers of surgical acute abdomen now uh, yes uh, when we are considering a life saving surgery we may not look at the glycemic control of the patient but we should ensure that once the patient is in our hands a good perioperative glycemic control now uh, we have to pay attention to correcting volume deficit this electrolytemia and acid base disorders and for this we need a hourly blood glucose monitoring and a 2 to 4 hourly electrolyte monitoring especially of serum potassium Now these were the ADA 2002 guidelines. Now I am going to discuss some newer evidences and additions to um, managing patients with diabetes. Now there were some uh, new inventions in the uh, in the arena of oral hypoglycemic agents like the SGLT2 inhibitors, the GLP-1 agonists, and the DPP-4 inhibitors, which came way later. Uh, in the 21st century before these guidelines were formulated by the ADA in 2002 so what are the current evidences suggesting their use in a surgical patient with diabetes now sglt2 inhibitors are basically the sodium uh, glucose transporter 2 inhibitors these sglt2 channels are present in the proximal renal tubules and their action is to prevent uh, is to prevent glucose reabsorption in the proximal renal tubule so when you give these inhibitors they cause glucosuria and a uh, uh, normal glycemia okay lowered blood glucose level in the plasma but these predispose to pa uh, predispose patients to euglycemic ketoacidosis okay and uh, glp1 agonists glp1 agonists are a glucagon like peptide 1 agonist these generally act by the incretin effect that is when you give an uh, so when you give a patient an oral a glucose load or anybody an oral glucose load the incretin effect is the stimulation of insulin release from the pancreatic uh, beta cells by the glp1 and uh, gip hormones okay gip is a uh, gl uh, glucose like insulinotropic polypeptide so this glp1 and gip are incretins which are stimulating the insulin release from the islet cells in response to an oral glucose load so when you give this glp1 agonist you are enhancing this incretin effect and thereby ensuring a good glycemic control that is the mechanism of action but these glp1 agonists have been found to cause delayed gastric emptying and that can predispose to the nausea and vomiting as such in a surgical patient we have a high incidence of post operative nausea vomiting due to anesthetic effects and so these glp1 agonists may be avoided in the perioperative setting and dpp4 inhibitors they are dipeptidyl phosphatases uh, phosphorylase and this uh, this enzyme is one that causes uh, inhibition of uh, this glp1 agonist uh, like the incretins the incretins are one which is stimulating insulin release and dpp enzyme is one that causes 
that causes the metabolism or uh, uh, metabolism of this uh, GLP. So once you give DPP-4 inhibitors, the activity of this enzyme is inhibited and you have more pronounced action of incretins, which is good for a glycemic control. So in the perioperative setting, no, DPP-4 inhibitors are not recommended according to the ADA guidelines, although there was a study done by Pascal et al. in 2017 which have shown that uh, cetagliptin was relatively safe and there was no significant increase in any perioperative morbidity mortality in patients with cetagliptin. But one thing is cetagliptin or the DPP-4 inhibitors, they have to be given in combination with a basal insulin. And also it has been found that saxagliptin, one of the DPP-4 inhibitors, is associated with cardiac failure. Keeping these considerations in mind, the keeping the overview in mind, the ADA has recommended to not use DPP-4 inhibitors in the perioperative setting. And all OHAs can be continued until the morning of surgery. That is, you skip the morning dose except for SGLT2 inhibitors, which you have to stop one day prior. Now, uh, newer evidences uh, on patients on insulin. Now, the long-acting basal insulin uh, is reduced by 20 to 25 percent uh, when in the pre-operative -op uh, period. Uh, it is administered on the morning of surgery. The basal insulin dose reduced is reduced by 50 to 75 percent instead of 20 to 25 as I just said in where where uh, in patients with a high basal insulin requirement where you are giving more than 60 percent of the total insulin as basal insulin. And uh, where you are giving total daily insulin of more than 80 units and where you have a higher risk of hypoglycemia. In these three conditions, you reduce the dose of basal insulin by 50 to 75 percent instead of just 20 to 25 percent. Now, I shall be discussing about what are uh, what are the types of insulin, right? Uh, one is the types of insulin where you have an ultra short acting, short acting, intermediate acting and long acting and ultra long acting insulins. So, uh, so what is a, uh, and also you have a rapid acting insulin. So, a rapid acting insulins are ones where you have the insulin lisproin as part, okay, which, uh, which have a rapid onset of action and which have a short duration of action. Then you have the short acting insulins, which are generally the regular insulin or act rapid in our ward use. And then you have the intermediate acting insulin, which are the NPH insulin or the isophane insulin, okay, uh, the duration of action is intermediate between the long acting and short acting. Long acting insulins are the ones which are given as basal insulin regimens. They are insulin glargin and detemir. And you have the ultra long acting insulins where you have a uh, lenti insulin which is ultra long acting. And another way to classify these insulins is how you are giving insulin therapeutically to the patient. One, you give insulin as a basal insulin. Two, you give the patient as a, a prandial insulin or um, and three is a correctional or supplemental insulin. So one is the basal insulin. Basal insulin is generally the long acting insulin that will maintain the basal requirement of basal insulin requirement of the patient. Then prandial insulin is something that you give the patient pre meals with every meal to counter the glycemia that is expected out of that meal intake. And then you have correctional or supplemental insulin that is to counteract the breakthrough hyperglycemia that is over and above the prandial insulin. So uh, coming back to the insulin therapy in a uh, diabetic surgical patient. Now ultra long acting insulin, uh, you need a dose reduction three days prior and in, intermediate, in case of intermediate acting insulin, you give the usual dose in the evening and you reduce the dose by 50% on the morning of surgery. And about pre-mixed insulins, they are not recommended in the perioperative setting because they have been associated with significant hypoglycemia. So they are generally replaced by long-acting insulins. Now, uh, when a patient is fasting, you do a blood glucose monitoring every four to six hourly. Now this is mandated when uh, like you need a patient NPO prior to surgery for a prolonged period. In such a case, you uh, give blood glucose, you uh, get a blood glucose monitoring four to six hourly 
and accordingly you give subcutaneous insulin and in case of the critically ill you uh, start the patients on continuous intravenous insulin infusion and not depend on subcutaneous insulin now intraoperatively if the surgery is lasting less than 4 hours you do a uh, two hourly or hourly blood glucose and accordingly you give subcutaneous insulin and if the surgery is lasting more than 4 hours you definitely start the patient on iv insulin infusion with hourly blood glucose monitoring in the post op period uh, when the patient is on ohas you restart the ohas as soon as the patient starts taking orally uh and uh when the patient starts taking orally you can restart the insulin also which based on the pre hospitalization or pre op regimen and uh this pre op hospitalization pre hospitalization regimen is generally a basal bolus regimen this basal insulin is uh, reduced by 20 to 25% if the oral intake is inadequate often we find patients post surgery not taking adequately in such a patient you can reduce the basal insulin by 20 to 25% and uh, the blood glucose monitoring is obviously done four times a day once the patient has been started orally before every meal and at bedtime now just a word on the basal bolus insulin regimen as i just discussed about what is a basal insulin a prandial insulin and a supplemental or correctional insulin now this basal bolus insulin regimen is a preferred regimen in all patients whether they are being planned for surgery or not planned for surgery this is because it mimics the physiological insulin release now the total daily dose of insulin is calculated according to the body weight of the patient you give insulin at the dose of 0.5 to 0.6 units per kg so if you have a 60 kg man it will come to around 30 units of insulin daily and you divide that 30 units insulin over the day into basal and prandial insulin so uh, 50% of the total dose is given as basal insulin and 50% is given as prandial or nutritional or bolus insulin that is every before every meal and uh, this basal insulin can be administered once or twice daily that is in the morning only of morning and night and uh, so when we are telling that 50% of the total insulin dose is given as nutritional insulin it means that 1/6 of the total insulin is given with each of the three meals right because uh, one third uh, so you ha- you have to give it thrice and three divided doses of half of total insulin is 1/6 of the total insulin and blood glucose monitoring is done before meals and at bedtime and when you have a breakthrough hyperglycemia when the blood glucose level that is checked before every meal is more than you anticipate more than the uh, recommended level then you give additional insulin which is called a correctional or supplemental insulin and that can follow that sliding scale insulin range now this is just a picture depicting how the basal bolus regimen is a physiological regimen and it mimics the normal insulin profile now here you see that this uh, in yellow is the normal insulin profile of a patient when you see that a constant basal level of insulin is maintained in the body and with every meal intake at breakfast at lunch at dinner you have three peaks of the normal insulin release so you plan in the basal bolus regimen to maintain this normal level of basal insulin and that is given as a long acting insulin and you give this short acting insulin or a prandial insulin with every meal intake okay before every meal now uh, coming to what is sliding scale insulin sliding scale insulin has gone out of favor uh, it is not recommended to keep a patient in the perioperative period on sliding scale regimen it uh, more likely to say it has got historical significance yet uh, we see in our hospitals that it is being practiced um, and this practice started as early as 1934 when the sliding scale insulin was used both in the glycemic control of a patient i mean of a normal patient of diabetes as well as in cases of hyperglycemic crisis like dka and hhs and earlier uh, they used to check the urine glucose to dictate the insulin requirements and uh, later on it was found to be inaccurate uh, 
and so they changed over to blood glucose monitoring to dictate uh, the insulin levels and this is not a physiological regimen so it has gone out of favor it causes severe fluctuations in uh, the blood glucose levels and is associated with perioperative morbidity and mortality so it can lead to severe hypoglycemia it can lead to uncontrolled hyperglycemia and so it is not recommended but uh, yes in cases of breakthrough hyperglycemia as i just mentioned uh, where you have an unexpected glucose uh, level uh, an anticipated glucose level uh, where in spite of the patient being on the basal bolus regimen then you add the insulin according to the sliding scale the extra units of insulin that is the supplemental or correctional insulin as a sliding scale and uh, the study by umi perez et al the rabbit two trial in 2007 is one which completely elucidated that there is uh, undoubtedly a better control with basal bolus regimen than the sliding scale insulin and however he found that there is a similar length of stay hospital stay with the similar uh, hypoglycemic episodes this did not corroborate with the studies prior to umi perez et al but uh, the advantage of umi perez et al study was that it was an rct and all other previous studies were just cohort studies Uh, which had found significant hypoglycemia resulting from sliding scale insulin so this study by umi perez et al has shown that yes basal bolus uh, regimen should be preferred but we com- cannot completely rule out sliding scale insulin and this is the scale of uh, sliding scale insulin that was used by umi perez et al where uh, like uh, where you can see in insulin sensitive individuals and insulin resistance individuals how you give the Uh, insulin uh, according to the blood glucose values now there are different institution protocols uh, varies institution to institution and there is no fixed uh, insulin uh, sliding scale insulin regimen in case of critically ill patients you give iv regular insulin infusion and give a uh, do a hourly blood glucose monitoring now when you transition the patient to subcutaneous insulin you overlap uh, the overlap should be between 2 to 3 hours according to the newest recommendations and the dose is uh, when the patient is npo you give the total daily dose of insulin as basal insulin when the patient is on oral diet you give 50% basal and 50% bolus according to the basal bolus regimen and the dose is based on the rate of insulin infusion like when you are newly starting a patient on uh, insulin infusion you calculate it according to uh, uh, the insulin infusion requirements over the last 6 to 8 hours and you extrapolate it to 24 hours and accordingly plan the insulin regimen and uh, you can also follow a home uh, based on the home insulin regimen uh, when you restart the patient with 70 to 80% of the total daily dose the patient was on previously or you give a weight based insulin regimen and as said before uh, you avoid a premixed insulin regimens perioperatively coming to the fluid and electrolyte management there is a very high risk of hyponatremia in diabetics that is because uh, uh, you give uh, I, you give dextrose mostly that can lead to dilutional hyponatremia and besides potassium you have to look at the patient serum sodium and lactate containing fluids can be used according to the recent studies it has been shown that lactate causes only about 1 millimole per liter which amounts to around 18 mg per deciliter glucose level rise which is not considered significant so yes you can very well use a hartman solution and ringer lactate in a diabetic patient in the perioperative period unlike the previous recommendations and the minimum glucose requirement to prevent catabolism is about 180 g per day and the ideal iv fluid uh, to be given in a diabetic patient is it should contain glucose to minimize the catabolism it should contain potassium to counter the hypokalemia that can result from insulin it should be an isotonic fluid and it does not cause hyperchloremic acidosis and uh, the fluid of choice therefore becomes d5 in 0.45% ns with 20 milliequivalents potassium added to it with infusion rate to be maintained between 83 to 125 ml per hour as has been emphasized by simpson et al in 2008 now coming to the perioperative management in diabetics on enteral and parenteral nutrition those on enteral feeds you plan uh, in diabetics a low carb and high mofa that is monounsaturated fatty acid and based enteral feed and uh, there you give basal insulin 
30 to 50 percent of the total dose because remember the patient is not on oral diet he is on enteral feed and you give 30 to 50 percent of the total dose nutritional insulin is given as 50 to 70 percent of the total dose and you give one unit of nutritional insulin per 10 to 15 grams of glucose in every bolus feed and uh, needless to say you do a blood glucose monitoring four to six hourly or before each feed and a parenteral nutrition uh, when you're giving a parental nutrition to a diabetic patient, you can either start a separate IV insulin infusion or you can add the insulin to the TPN. How do you do that? You give 80 to 100 percent of the total insulin dose and add it to the TPN. And or you calculate one unit insulin per gram of glucose in that TPN and later adjust it according to the glycemic trends. Now, so far we have discussed diabetes in surgery. Now we are going to discuss surgery in diabetes uh, given the topic is diabetic patient and the surgeon. So yes, diabetes is a chronic progressive illness and in spite of medical management, it continues to grow and it has a, the insulin management is just a temporary measure. It is not going to halt the complications of diabetes, neither the disease which was shown by the UK prospective diabetes study and the mortality rates remain the same whether they are on therapy or not. So uh, what are the surgery? Surgery uh, that you plan for a diabetic patient are bariatric or metabolic surgery and islet cell transplantation in type 1 diabetics. And surgery was the first time that uh, it was understood that we can not just achieve control of diabetes, we can ensure a remission of the diabetes. Now, coming to bariatric surgery in diabetes, a uh, complete and durable remission uh, was observed in post gastric bypass for morbid obesity in 1980s. Now, Buchwald et al. in 2004 did a meta analysis of 22,000 patients where they observed a diabetes remission of around 99% post uh, biliopancreatic diversion or duodenal switch and 84% post gastric bypass and around 44% after restrictive procedures like uh, lab gastric banding. Now it, it, it was obviously found that uh, intestinal bypass was more effective in the remission of diabetes as compared to simply a restrictive procedure that I shall discuss later. Uh, then Perry et al. in 2008 also found a survival benefit in patients undergoing bariatric surgery with improved cardiovascular risk factors. Now this is the mechanism how a, a bariatric surgery can lead to remission of diabetes. This is not because of the weight loss. This goes way uh, beyond it. And we have two hypotheses suggesting uh, this. We have the hindgut hypothesis and the foregut hypothesis. Now here uh, in so in cases of intestinal bypass, where the proximal uh, where the duodenum and the proximal jejunum are bypassed. Now, uh, we have uh, this bypassing of anti incretin factors which are generally released from the intestine and that can cause hyperglycemia. So once it is bypassed, so you get a better glycemic control post bariatric surgery. This was the foregut hypothesis. What is the hindgut hypothesis? Hindgut hypothesis is uh, when you directly uh, lead uh, the nutritional load or the nutritional chyme reaches directly the distal bowel the ileum, uh, then you find that there is an increased stimulation of incretin with the bypassing of the anti-incretin factors in the proximal bowel. So this uh, balance between anti-incretin and incretin is in becomes in favor of incretins. So you have a lower plasma glucose and a better glycemic control. Coming to the role of islet cell transplantation in diabetes, and uh, it is uh, only for type 1 diabetics and ideal candidate being an insulin sensitive person with type 1 diabetes with poor subjective recognition of hypoglycemia with recurrent severe hypoglycemic episodes despite optimized medical treatment. So this islet cell transplantation in such kind of type 1 diabetics is generally considered to be a life saving procedure. The islet prerequisites are we should ensure adequate purity more than 50% a dose of more than 5000 islet uh, equivalents per kg and a settled tissue volume less than 7 cc and the islet should be sterile on gram stain. Now uh, 
when you plan islet cell transplantation what you do is uh, the pancreas is transected at the mid body or at the neck and then you have to isolate the islet cells from the exocrine tissue so basically the process is uh, isolation purification and installation and nowadays the gold standard is the intraportal islet cell infusion uh, with uh, recently edmonton protocol of 2000 which is uh, the immunosuppressive therapy to be followed following islet cell transplantation based on tacrolimus sirolimus and anti cd25 map this has further increased the amount of islet cells that can be installed into the portal vein that is uh, more than 13000 here we just saw that we need more than 5000 but up to 13000 islet cells uh, islet cell equivalents per kg can be infused by following the edmonton protocol and uh, you a uh, following installation of uh, islet cells into the portal vein uh, this portal vein is generally accessed percutaneous transhepatic route and you give heparin at the rate of 70 unit per kg of the recipient and delivered intraportally along with the islets followed by heparin iv infusion at 3 to 5 units per kg per hour such that you maintain a aptt between 60 to 80 seconds that this heparin infusion is added so that uh, we prevent uh, the portal vein thrombosis the other complications undoubtedly are hepatic bleeding and liver bleeding from the liver because we are uh, going through a percutaneous transhepatic route there are uh, severe inflammatory reactions that can be elicited by injection of islet cells into the portal vein and uh, most subjects uh, have been found to lose complete insulin dependence by 3 to 5 years with only 10% remaining insulin free by 5 years but nevertheless these 5 years is the time that you buy for the patients of type 1 diabetes with severe uh, uncontrolled hypoglycemia and those ha- they have to be taken on off insulin for certain period of time so newer there have been newer advances in this islet cell uh, transplantation where they have been uh, they are uh, being tried for being transplanted into the renal subcapsular space into the omentum and uh, even into the testes but all these studies have not uh, shown a good out- outcome and uh, so we still find the gold standard to be intraportal islet cell infusion so this was my discussion on diabetic patient and the surgeon thank you Thank you. 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 Thank you.